a huge January 6th guilty plea. And is Putin losing it? The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is The Rick Wilson. And we have a big show for you tonight because, as always, there's a lot of stuff going on. We have a fantastic guest that I hope everyone stays for, Tom Nichols. He's an expert on national security, on Russia. He speaks Russian. He taught at the Naval War College. And he's everyone's favorite curmudgeon on Twitter. So, and he's a friend of the show. So make sure you stay I tuned. I thought I Tom. was everybody's favorite curmudgeon on Twitter. No, no, Tom. There could be Nichols. only one. No, he's way more curmudgeonly than you, Rick. You're just snarky as hell. <laughs> um, he's a snarker too, but he's he's got certain pet peeves that he talks about that are famous. Uh, you don't really have, you don't talk about that as much. So he gets the honor. But stay stay tuned for Tom. We're gonna have a, a really robust conversation about where we are right now with. Ukraine with Putin, um, with military strategy, because I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about what's happening, and Tom sure. is going to be here to answer them for us, so stay tuned for him. Um, Rick, before we get to that, we have a couple of headlines. Um, I just said in the opening, there's a big January 6th guilty plea. Oh, yes. And this is bigger than some of the others. We've seen a lot of activity with m- more lower level um, perpetrators here. They're important too. But remember a couple weeks ago, there was this whole thing about seditious conspiracy and how the Justice Department mm-hmm. charged 11 Oath Keepers with this seditious conspiracy charge, which is pretty significant. That's a big deal. Um, it knocked down all of the talking points on the right and Fox and everywhere else that, oh, it wasn't an insurrection. No one was charged with this. Yeah, well, now we have someone not only charged, but they pled guilty today. His mm-hmm. name is Joshua James. And he is part of the leadership of these Oath Keeper bastards. And not only has he pled guilty, he has turned state's evidence. He is going to testify against Mr. Stuart Rhodes, who's the leader of the Mm -hmm. Oath Keepers. This charge, Rick, it carries up to 20 years in federal prison. He's probably going to get between seven and nine, they say. But this is real time. Let me tell you, all these cosplaying jerk-offs, they are suddenly meeting reality head on. And that while the Justice Department grinds slowly, it grinds thoroughly. Mm-hmm. And these guys are facing up to the fact that we've got their encrypted messages because idiots in their group shared them. Um, we've got their communications. We understand where they were. They've geolocated all their telephones. Um, and they're going to roll this thing up like they would any other criminal conspiracy. Like a now, terrorist conspiracy. Now, right. We, and now, right? I, I was just going to say that. Mm-hmm. Now, you may be familiar with, with, with us doing that. Um, when we rolled up, you know, a lot of things in the past, like the Sarnayev brothers when they attacked Boston, like uh, the Al Qaeda cells in America, we've done this. We're actually pretty good at this part when we put our minds to it, and and the idea that you could keep saying, "Oh, it was Antifa, it was the FBI," you know, these guys, the, these idiots on the right is like, "What about Ray Epps?" This fantasy figure in their head who they claim was the FBI instigator. No, he wasn't. Right. This was a conspiracy led from the top, from Trump's key supporters, guys like Roger Stone and Steve Bannon and Ali Alexander and Charlie Kirk and Peter Navarro and John Eastman, where they sought to engage in a shock and awe campaign against the Capitol to break up. And, and what we've seen in this other memo, it came out of the 1-6 Commission um, for the court filing, which I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to be one. Well- Hold that thought, Rick, because we're going to get to that in a second. Hold but yeah, thought. let me just loop back. We'll get yeah. to that. But that loops back to the fact that there was a thoroughgoing conspiracy afoot. These people in the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and the Patriot Front and, and Talking Points USA, all these white supremacist groups um, that were there, all these violent groups that were there, they came together to engage in this conspiracy. This conspiracy will be rolled up. It will move upward. It will hurt them. It will get them. And it's a lot harder to go, it's Antifa. Yeah. No, it's not, according to the evidence, according to court filings, which is indisputable. And something that we we had the, the Chiron there for a second, but that that's in this guilty plea, which should alarm everyone. And we've talked about this before, about the quick reaction force 
mm-hmm. that had been reported a year ago, right? Yep. Shortly after uh, January 6th, there were these reports coming out that there was this quick reaction force of heavily armed men outside of D.C., hanging out in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river. Which getting folks, ready if to... you haven't been there, you could be downtown in oh, seven, yes. seven, eight minutes. Without traffic, but yes. Right, right. <laughs> um, it's not that far away, and they were they were ready to be activated. And this was still kind of in the rumor mill being reported, but now we know for sure that was true, that yeah. there was a weapons cache in a, uh, a comfort inn in that town. And he said quote, that they vowed to use lethal force against anyone who tried to remove President Trump from the White House. Yep. That included the National Guard. Mm-hmm. That these guys, these, these, like you said, these cosplay idiots thought that they were actually going to take up arms to defend Donald Trump in the White House if they were, if he, it was deemed that he lost and he was supposed to be, be removed. Right. This is this is serious. This is not just, you know, these guys talking on, on Twitter and puffing their chests. They literally had weapons and were prepared to do it and were organizing around it, which is a fucking crime. And that's exactly why they're going to end up in federal prison. And I hope every single one of them I ends up so there um, and <laughs> Donald Trump is next to them. But that's a different story. So you guys better us- flip now while you can. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, that leads us to the next part of the big January 6th news this week, which is the January 6th committee issued a filing in California against this John Eastman. Now, this is the guy most famous for the coup memo. Uh, he's this former law professor and, um, you know, he should know better, but he's gone off the deep end into the mm-hmm. cacophony of kookery here. And he's the one that was really pushing for Pence, trying to come up with this legal justification. There is none for Pence to overturn the election and throw the not certify the election on January 6th and throw it back to the states. All of that nonsense. Well, why is this significant? Well, he's refusing to turn over documents. He's turned over some, but he's not turning over everything because he's claiming attorney-client privilege. They're in court litigating this. In that court filing, it has been discovered that the January 6th committee believes that not only Eastman, but Trump also engaged Mm -hmm. in a criminal conspiracy to interfere with an official proceeding. This is something that we've had guests on the show talk about from mm-hmm. Harry Littman to mm-hmm. uh, Ryan Goodman. They've been speculating about this, mm-hmm. but now we're seeing it actually play out in court documents. And Harry Littman, our, our good friend in front of the show, Absolutely. put up a tweet, uh, to, uh, I think it was last night, about this when it broke. He said, the 1-6 committee brief is a bombshell, but it's filed in the context of ongoing litigation. So they essentially had no choice. Nevertheless, all concerned, and particularly the former president, can't fail to grasp a huge, the huge significance of the argument. So what does this all mean? Does this mean this is the smoking gun? No, because it's a civil proceeding and it's up to the Department of Justice to actually bring any type of criminal charges like they did against the Oath Keepers. So we are speaking to you, Merrick Garland and the Justice Department lawyers. For the love of God, please get off. move get forward. The, yeah. Get off your asses and move forward with criminal charges against these people. Don't stop with the precedent that a no, no former president's ever been charged or whatever. We don't want to hear that. It's clear what happened here. And I'm re- I hope, I just hope it to, and pray that they're actually working on this. There's been no indication they are. Look, they, they, they occasionally spectacularly compartmentalize things and hide them. They generally don't spectacularly compartmentalize them and hide them. We haven't seen some of the same external signals of people getting subpoenaed that you might see in a case like this. Um, if it was going to go forward with alacrity. My concern is, as it has been for a long time, in a few weeks, the DOJ will say, hands off, it's an election year, can't do it. Right. And which I think is, which I think is exactly what Bannon and Trump and these people have been, they've been trying to run out the clock. The committee's sort of dilatory nature has given them several months of running out the clock. Yeah, and I think they're going to try to run out the clock and get a Republican House back in place, and then uh, and then try to reelect Trump in twenty four, and and all get pardoned, and everybody goes away. Well, this is where the the institutionalists, you know, I'm gonna, I think I'm an institutionalist in a lot of ways, but this is where that needs to be put aside because you're not dealing with normal political actors; they're not acting in good mm-hmm. faith here. That's right. So you can't just sit back and say, "Well, we need to be prudent," and and because this is unprecedented, and the guidance says. 
damn all that at this the point. Guidance. What we're dealing, you know, we're dealing with really serious existential threats to our democracy. That's right, guidance, because somebody decided 40 years ago that it wouldn't be prudent to indict a sitting president. That's not law. It's not codified. That's an opinion. And it's now, like saying when the fire truck rolls up to your house, uh, those two guys haven't had OSHA training, so they can't fight the fire. Right. right. That's right. That's right. It's it's what? it's like, what? stop this. There's plenty, plenty, plenty of evidence for them to move forward on this. And maybe now's the time to set the precedent. You can't commit crimes as president and get away with it. The end. Yeah. Now, simple enough. Simple enough. Should be, right? We're, we're solving all the Call world's problems. Call me crazy, problems. but yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> solving the world's problems on the breakdown tonight. Um, lastly, before we bring in Tom Nichols, Rick, I know this is your home state, but I've got to tell you, Ron DeSantis has to be one of the most infuriating, obnoxious jerk offs walking the planet. What a, you know, that's a you, feature, not a bug, right? <laughs> I don't want it to be. I love Florida. My family had a house in the Keys for like 20 years. I love Florida. I but, the, you know, this guy just gets under my skin. I, him and I, I, want you to look at, I want you to look at Ron DeSantis as as sort of the perfect apotheosis of where MAGA politics is going. It's not just about the base of the Republican Party. It's about the crazy base that thinks, you know, that Breitbart is basically the Wall Street Journal or the Paris Review of Books. Mm. It's the crazy base that thinks that Fox has too, it, it's gone too far to the left and under the influence right. of George Soros. Right. It's the crazy base that reads Facebook about, you know, Hillary Clinton's cannibal child predation ring in a pizza restaurant and goes, well, yeah, obviously. Right. He <laughs> the ones appeals that to Donald that the segment only. <laughs> And he appeals to this idea that is very embedded in the online right, which is the, you know, the oppositional defiant disorder on everything, the constant, you know, the gotcha games, the junior Alinskyites, you know, all that stuff. And, and look, and it comes down to a more fundamental thing. He's basically got like this small dick energy about him that will not quit. Don't they all? And, and he just he just doesn't get along with people. You can tell he well, doesn't connect with people on a human level. No, let's, let's show people what started this rant. What yeah. inspired this rant? Ron DeSantis went to a local college in Hillsborough County, Florida. It's a Tampa area, right? Uh, Rick. Yep. And um, Where I'm from. yeah. And um, he yelled and bullied a bunch of high school students for wearing masks. Let's look. You do not have to wear those masks. I mean, please take them off. <laughs> Honestly, it's not doing anything, and we got to stop with this COVID theater. So if you want to wear it, fine, but this is a, this is ridiculous. 70,000 people have died from COVID in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. okay? It is scientifically proven that masks work to help prevent a airborne transmissible disease. You jerk off. So the fact that he goes and he's still pushing this lie, this narrative, because it placates the, the base that you're talking yeah. about, Rick, is absolutely infuriating and so revealing about the type of person he is. And then he turns around, he bullies high school students and then turns around and uses it to fundraise. Of course he does. That is the ecosystem in which they live. Do something transgressive and cruel and stupid. When you are criticized for doing something transgressive, cruel and stupid, then go on Fox News and say, they're trying to cancel me. Ah, right. I'm just fighting for freedom with a B. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look how tough I am. Look once how much Fox News the runs lives. the story, go out and go to your email fundraising people and then go and have your paid government staff, okay, that work for the taxpayers of Florida, go out and get in um, ideological fights on Twitter and then start the whole process over and over and over again. And then so, here we are, and that's how you end up with a million people dead in, in America from COVID, from you know hundreds of thousands of, of preventable deaths because people listen to assholes like him and Trump and those, the rest of them trying to tell you that masks don't work or that a vaccine doesn't work or that you know horse dewormer and bleach up your ass is going to cure you from COVID. It's 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 part of what our next guest's book was about, his original book. Um, the death of expertise, mm -hmm. but he's also written another book, but it's part of that problem here, this cognitive dissonance, this Dunning-Keurig, I think it's called, uh, 
uh, syndrome where people think they're experts when they don't know shit about anything. And the more you try to tell them that the facts don't matter, the more they dig in. And we have seen this play out and it's literally cost lives. There's also Dunning Keurig, which is people right. who can't operate their coffee machines. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I think on that note, we should uh, bring in our, our guests and shift focus to Ukraine. Um, Tom Nichols, uh, if you're on Twitter, you know Radio Free Tom. But he's also a friend of the show. He's written, uh, like I said, The Death of Expertise. He's also written a more recent book called Our Own Worst Enemy, which is an excellent book. I suggest you read that too. Um, he's an expert in national security, speaks Russian, taught for 25 years at the Naval War College. He knows a little something about what's happening in the world today over in that part of the world. Tom Nichols, welcome. Hi, guys. Good to be with you. Hey, thanks for coming on, Tom. So, Tom, I want to start off and ask you... Um, about what's happening right now, current state of play with Putin and Ukraine. We heard that there was this um, potential ceasefire sort of kind of agreement that, that, that resulted from the talks today. But at the same time, we also um, have heard about um, the, the barrage of these cities and Kherson has been taken. Um, what's happening? Where are we at? Um, okay, the first thing of, is always to say that anything we know, we, we're not sure we know, because, you know, talking about her son being taken, um, you know, one of the things that st strikes me is how quickly people say things like, well, the Russians now control her son. No, the Russians are in her son. Right. But if there's one thing we should have learned from Afghanistan and Vietnam and, and uh, you know, other such operations, um, this is probably a situation where the Russians control where they happen to be standing at any mm -hmm. given moment. So this notion that like the city has capitulated and the mayor is coming out, excuse me, something in my eye, uh, that, the, that the mayor is, you know, coming out and saying, okay, here's the keys to the city. You guys are in charge now. Um, I don't think any of that's happening yet. So be wary of those um, reports. I think the overall situation is that we're still seeing the outcome of a gigantic strategic miscalculation by Vladimir Putin. For sure. That's what makes it so dangerous. Someone got to this guy and said, cakewalk. They're going to, you'll be greeted as liberators. liberators. I, I was at that rodeo once before. I was going to say, you know, not the, not the first time, uh, you know, as Americans, we have to be a little careful about saying, oh, no, who could make that mistake? But um, I think he made that, that mistake. And um, I think. Um, the, What's the biggest evidence of that? Tom, what makes you, what's the biggest thing planning, that makes you think that? That their planning cycle is so off at this point that, right. you know, this was supposed to be done within days. They weren't, they weren't, they clearly weren't planning for this. They weren't provisioned for it. They didn't expect this level of resistance. Putin is clearly furious. You see him on television. Mm -hmm. He can't believe this is happening. And so he's escalating his, um, his comments to things like, you know, that's this is where we get all these Nazis and, right. um, you know, um, what was the other thing? Ban Banderites and all this. Banderites. Kind of Soviet, that was you know, a callback. I heard that, that one was a in call years. Back for old Cold Warriors. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, Banderites. Wow. That's, uh, that's a deep cut. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's the evidence there is the complete disarray. The Kiev is still standing. Zelensky's alive. They've been bogged down. They've only had some real successes in the South, but there's a lot of Russians there. They have naval support. Um, you know, that that was a, a much better playing field for them down there. But they are um, screwing this up royally, which is not to say they're going to lose. And I think people need to get over that, too, of saying, well, you know, the Russians are going to get chased out of Ukraine. The Russians aren't going to get chased out of Ukraine. They're going to flatten the place and they're going to yeah. kill a lot of people. And, and we're just going to have to you know, steal ourselves. If you think what you've been seeing now is bad, it, it's going to get a lot worse because now Putin's been humiliated and the man does not deal with humiliation. He is, um, you know, you know th th think of it this way. He has said, I'm, he said at the outset, I'm going there to rescue people who are functionally Russians. They are one people, Ukraine and Russia. Um, and this is, you know, from Nazis and all these other people. And yet, as I, I, I tweeted earlier, he is literally bombing territory that has the bodies of Soviet soldiers in it who right. liberated this area from the Nazis. You know, um, I, I think it's, and, and if I, he's willing to do that to people he thinks are Russians, just like Russians, right. he, he's lost. He's lost the plot. 
Sorry, sorry. You know, you know, Tom, I, I think it th surprises guys like you and me when we when we were but when we were but lads in the in the end of the the, the Cold War. You know, we used to have this vision that the Eighth Tank Guards Army was going to come roaring through the Fulda Gap in a beautifully planned, logistically supported combined arms operation and sweep into the heart of Europe. And they were going to button hook around and 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 divide Europe and and there was very little we could do except go to nuclear war. But it is kind of a, the, the, the sort of decrepit state of their equipment, the obviously shitty state of their training and, and everything else. You know, it just strikes me that this has got to be one more element of Putin's humiliation that, that they took enough of their combat-ready units in there and threw them into a meat grinder, and they've lost on a low boundary like 1,200 and on a high boundary like 6,000 of their of their troops so far and they're not moving and when you're on a modern battlefield when you stop moving you start dying I'm they're, they're taking casualties at a rate that we weren't taking in afghanistan i right. mean you know and it's important to point out that for for years after the end of the cold war russian pilots in particular they didn't do enough to, compared to nato pilots they didn't do enough training that would even no. allow them to be airworthy that would allow them to fly they were getting training hours that would that if that were if those were nato pilots that would be such a low amount of hours in the cockpit right. we wouldn't let them fly correct um uh, uh, yeah that's a, that's a, as a pilot nerd i can tell you flying a high performance jet aircraft only 25 hours a year <laughs> is insufficient right you, you're not going to be current and 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 you're not going to be you know tuned up that's and insufficient for a cessna it, look <laughs> if i was only flying 20 hours a year i'd go like Maybe I should go out and get my instructor. Just, ride, just take a ride. Just, just take a check a ride, maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I flew, I, last year I flew about 90 hours, which is for a private pilot, decent amount. But, you know, it was only when I'm flying like regularly that I feel safe about it. I'm not flying a high performance fighter jet aircraft, which. In hostile conditions. Right. right. Which, you know, and I know everybody wants a no fly zone, which, you know, as unfortunately, I think he's bluffing about nuclear war. You think he's bluffing, but these accidents and incidents and you know bumping paint on planes and ships—that's what leads. What scares me more about an escalation than Putin turning the key. Yeah, that I, you know, the the thing about a no-fly zone. Um, first of all, I cannot imagine um, why. I mean, I can. I can under. I wrote a piece about it this morning in the Atlantic. I get it. I'm I'm enraged. I'm. I feel the grief. Um, but what a gift to Putin to make this into an, into NATO's war. That's probably the only thing that could save him now is to say, right. see, I told you it's a NATO war. NATO's after me. NATO's after me. And the Russian, you know, there are, there are a lot of Russians who are not good with fighting their, their brothers and sisters in Ukraine to be totally okay with fighting NATO. Yeah. Uh, I think, and, I think, uh, I think that's right. Uh, and, and I think as a, a friend of mine said this morning, he goes, you throw in enough stingers, every bit of Ukraine can become a no-fly zone. Well, and that's what and, we did in Afghanistan, isn't it? Well, we yes, after returning the favor for what they right. did to us in Vietnam, right? Yep, um, correct. You know, hey, how are why, how are guys in rice paddies downing you know B fifty twos? Right. How are those SA twos being operated by guys who uh, who who eat cold rice and who don't wear shoes? Them? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know the the idea though that we can flood the zone. I think with enough equipment to keep humiliating them and keep pushing them down and, and break the morale and the momentum. I, I think Biden's actually, and, and NATO's pursuing the right strategy right now, generally. I mean, we're now putting them in the box. They, they, the, the Ukrainians, as long as we can keep their morale at a point where they're willing to resist, it seems to me that giving them enough jabs and enough stingers you know, is, a, is a significant alteration of the playing field. I, and I, my my big worry, and you know, this might might be my old Cold War gene. I mean, I, I, Rick, I don't know if he's bluffing, but um, like you, I don't want to be in a situation where accidents can happen, and suddenly right. people have to back up their bullshit and yeah. and say, "Well, I didn't want to do it." But um, but the other thing about this um, with the the danger of escalation here is. I think he actually could get so desperate because this thing has just turned into a gigantic 
can I can I drop an f bomb? Oh yeah, have Please. you watched our show? <laughs> it's a gigantic clusterfuck. Yeah, um, you know he is. I mean, his economy is off the rails. I mean, I'm really shocked to see this. I mean, I didn't think that the Europeans. I'm, mean, you know, the European Union saying Blew we're going to send, you know, military aid uh, to like beyond this, a world I couldn't have imagined two weeks ago. Um, I think he's going to try and provoke NATO. Day, day one, day one of this. Foul. Day one of this, I had a friend who's a former Merkel advisor say to me, you know, we're really going to try to do something and maybe delay Nord Stream, but that'll be about as much as we can do. But that changed and, real fast. And two days <laughs> later, I talked to the same person. It's like, it's like, well, you know, we're thinking about just rolling over a bunch of equipment to them tomorrow. I may drive a truck myself. Fuck it. We'll go. You know, and, and, and their determination to, and I think Germany sees a moment here where if you want to save the European Union project, you got to save NATO, and you gotta you gotta protect the, the 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 idea of free and democratic free market economies or relatively free market economies throughout Europe, and and I think they see it. I, I it, the change in my political friends in Germany is so striking I can hardly express it. And and you know it's it's interesting because the there's some some of the old time you know, neo-Trumpers or whatever they are now uh, saying, well, you know, but this shows that it's still old power politics and this is right. the end of old Europe and the end of the, or the end of new Europe and the globalized, the blah, blah, blah. No, if anything, Putin, um, Corey Shockey at AEI had yep. a great piece the other day where she said, this I is the renewal it. of the Western liberal, like Correct. Putin has suddenly given everybody a reason to go, oh yeah, that's why we have alliances and transnational mm -hmm. organizations, right. And right. international institutions. And norms and institutions. Right. And yeah. You know? I love the people are saying, well, this is really the death blow for globalization. D globalization is the thing that Putin is giving Putin a gigantic migraine right now. And what he doesn't you understand know? is that once this is done and Ukraine is an independent nation again, it will become, you know, it will become a, a bastion of this. They will never walk back into, into this sort of Soviet Russian model because they're going to have trade and commerce and interaction with 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 the rest of Europe at a level that I mean I, it would not shock me to see their GDP pass Russia's in 25 years. You know, I it strikes me and I and I kind of said this sort of bravely on Twitter the other day and I think I'm I'm still believing this. We've seen the high water mark of post-Soviet Russian power yep. and it passed about 10 days ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think and, that actually when this is over God, God willing that you know it ends with something less than the day after. Right. Um, but that, and it may not end, it's not going to end next week and it's not going to end next month. But mm -hmm. when this thing is finally done, whether it takes six months or six years, you are going to have yet another Russian rollback. You know, I mean, Putin is bringing about everything he feared. This is a isn't great that example. That's a perfect that, point, Tom. Yeah. Isn't that usually what happens though? I mean, our friend Ruth ben -Giat talks about that in Strongman. And she's been tweeting about this a lot also as a historian, that oftentimes this is when the authoritarians overstep, they end up, you know, uh, receiving the fate that they fear the most, which is, seems to be the path that Putin is on here. Yeah, I mean, he's, um, I think, you know, the last thing he wants is a hyper-nationalistic anti-Russian Ukraine on his border. Right. Well, wow. Um, <laughs> you know, if, if that, because after this, I mean, there are. We've been talking a lot about how Russians, you know, have a lot of Ukrainian relatives and friends and family sure. members. That goes both ways. Ukrainians have a lot of people mm -hmm. in Russia. They don't have a natural enmity for a lot of people okay. they to whom they are married. But I keep thinking, I keep watching this and saying, no matter how this comes out, these people are going to hate your guts forever. Yeah. Here's you, a good you example. Have created an entire new national mythology here mm -hmm. um, that is not about ethnic ukrainianism but about being a, and, and i'm kind of stealing this point from ann applebaum who had a great line where she said this is putin is practically teaching the ukrainians about civic nationalism as opposed to the right. blood and soil you know she she he, he he's teaching them about another word for civic nationalism is patriotism right that, that it's a civic form of love of country um because of what he's done i think you know russia is going to it's going to 
the, the kind of things that have been implemented against Russia now, they are going to take years to unwind the damage from this. Putin, uh, and this is one of the reasons I worry about Putin getting desperate mm -hmm. and trying to just lash out, because he, there's a reason that Bismarck once referred to preventive war like this one as committing suicide out of a fear out of, of death. Right. Right. Yep. That's right. I want to show an example of what you're talking about, Tom, um, as far as this this civic nationalism and the humanity on the Ukrainian side and the what's clear. It's clear that there is this um, uh, empathy for the young Russian soldiers who have been thrust into this that thought they were going to boot camp. And the next thing you know, they're on the front lines fighting Ukrainians and they're going, what the hell are we doing here? Because we're seeing these reports of some Russian soldiers uh, surrendering and, and and being really upset when they do. But the way the Ukrainians are handling it, I think, is tremendous. Let's take a look at this video. That is a young Russian soldier who surrendered, and the Ukrainians let him call his mother on FaceTime. Okay, but I'm going to beat Dr. Buzzkill again here for That's a minute okay. and say, this is video provided by the Ukrainians. This guy's been captured. He's on tape. You know, approach all of this. Uh, one thing I have to say, regardless of the prominence of this video, the Ukrainians have played a vastly stronger Amazing. information game than the Russians. That's the first next off, object. The first Russians off, were... the Russians failed to secure the primary strategic objective in any information war, which is adequate cat memes. <laughs> Rick, you're still in the thunder for, for in a minute. Wait, hold your fire on that. Um, but Tom, no, I'm but glad you're bringing this. You can't wait up. to get to the. Cat. I know I the know. cat that's memes. The, that's all that I, matters. I will say that's this. all that matters. I, I will say this though. Tom bringing up the, that point about that that video, we, we have to be careful with it. Is part of the, uh, the part of the discussion we wanted to get to about the propaganda war because even if it's true or not, or if it's propaganda, it looks like the Ukrainians are winning that war. Yeah. Although, again, on the ground, you know, I'm just uh, before we came on, I was watching some footage from uh, Kharkiv and, you know, on the mm -hmm. ground, it doesn't it, you know who's winning this war right. by so sheer force. But, but, you know, the, the information war when it comes to things like sanctions and international will and, you know, losing a vote at the U.N. 141 to five. Uh, you know, those things matter. And I think, again, Terry, you asked me earlier, what's the evidence that, the, you know, the Russians screwed this up? They weren't ready for this. They, no. you know, look, the Russians are not amateurs at information ops. They know what they're doing. They didn't think they were going to need them. Mm -hmm. They thought that they were going to be standing there and, you know, walking across beds of roses and taking pictures with their arms around happy, you know, Ukrainian babushkas, thanking them for liberating them from the Nazis. They, the, the Ukrainians being a much freer people living in a free society. You know, the other reason the Russian meme game isn't strong, the in Russian info game isn't strong, they're scared shitless of their own government. Sure. You know, sure. so you're fighting this, this culture that ha is used to expressing itself and being online and talking to people in other countries. Um, and it just breaks my heart. It didn't have to, it didn't have to be this way for the Russians either, because I think the average Russian, I, I can't remember who said this the other day, but the, the line was, there are the, this war is supported by exactly one person in Russia. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's Putin. Even his guys, I again, before we came on, I, I was reading a report, I guess the, um, the foreign intelligence guys, oh, this is now the hot war and we're in it and the West. That, that's the same guy that got his ass handed to him in that meeting with Putin five or six days ago, where Putin's saying, come on, show, you know, spit it out. And right. he's standing there going, ha, 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 mm -hmm. There's nobody who thought this was a good idea except Putin and the, I don't know, the, the right wing Orthodox priests and hyper nationalists surrounding him or something. Um, it, but, but the average Russian didn't, you know, it's a tragedy for everybody involved that this has turned into a horrendous war that will, is going to put the Russians back in a box for a long time to come. Uh, I, I think the economic sanctions have been so thorough and, and you know, that, that I talked about this the other day, that the old Rick formula, Wilson doctrine, the, the Rick, Rick Wilson, Wilson doctrine, sees the yachts, sees the yachts, the, but that old formulation that the defector Victor Rezin said of the, the Russia was controlled by the, the, the crocodile of the party, the KGB and the army. 
Well, now there's still sort of the, the, the FSB side of it for, for Putin, um, but the oligarchs and the army are now, I think, both extremely nervous about where this leads them uh, in, this, in this contemporary formulation. And, and the fact that the oligarchs are now fleeing to the Maldives and doing their best to sell any asset that isn't tied down for, for dollars, um, I think this is going to bring, I mean, the reason they moved to London and Miami and New York is because they love the West. They love the lifestyle. They love living that beautiful life, you know, with, with the money they dragged out of the, out of the kleptocracy. Well, all that shit's over and they have very few motivations now. And I don't think he's going to go back and, and, you know, renationalize every industry. There's too much money to be made for, for Putin himself. That's but, why they're speaking out now, the oligarchs. Put, I mean, Tom, is, could this take Putin down? Man, you know, um, is there a chance that Putin could be removed? Very tiny, but Small. if if it if it's a war with NATO, zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then then it's a rally around the flag. Um, I almost wish Putin would try and renationalize all that stuff and and right? you know fight back against the oligarchy. Because boy, that the one thing that would really put him in danger would be doing something like that. Right. Um, you know, the army. Rick brought up the army. Um, you know, Putin to take a line from everyone's favorite movie and the one that explains everything about life, the Godfather, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure before this thing started and they were all sitting there, Putin said, and if this operation goes bad, I'm going to blame some of the people in this room. And since the army were the guys who said, sure, we can pull this off. Um, you know, their, their incentive to, to put distance between themselves and, and the boss, um, cause he's going to blame them. They're the ones that took this on. I'm sure the FSB guys were saying, eh, we're not so sure about this. The other thing to notice about the army, to note about the army, the defense minister is the only guy that's been the true survivor in this big game. For 20, uh, right. like 22 years, right? Shogun's oh, been no. Since He's longer. been in the Kremlin in some form or another since, Gorbachev, since right? 1991. Mother yeah. of God. There's some Literally. secret sauce. Um, he, was the, he was the minister for emergency situations um, mm -hmm. at, yeah, under Yeltsin. Means. He's mm -hmm. never been in the military. He's now the defense minister. He's kind of a trusted, I'm sorry to go off on old time no, no, know, no. terminology here, but he's kind of a trusted broker in the sense that he could never really make a, a play for power because he's not an ethnic he's Russian. Ethnic. He's, right. he's, he's, he, he's a Tuvan. He's from mm -hmm. um, um, this kind of area in Central Asia near Mongolia um, so, you know, he's been a Noted survivor. Noted for throat singing. <laughs> yes. The most famous people from that region are, are the throat singers. Throat singers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, oh, my God. But if this goes no, bad, look it up, Tara. Look I up believe two you. Throat singing when we're done. I, you will, I you believe you. She's sitting there thinking, she's sick, sitting there thinking, Nick like, are these guys are making one of their chain? creepy inside jokes about <laughs> no, throat singers. No, no. No, it's a thing. Listen, it's a real thing. I, Listen, I I worked for a member of Congress who used to uh, every every um, St. Patrick's Day play his jaw harp. So I there there's nothing that I that I have that surprises me. So go ahead, throat singing, jaw you, harping. You whatever. can have that one, Rick. I'll, I'll I'm going to pass on jaw harping. <laughs> uh, but, I got but nothing the point on that. Is, uh, you know, if some point Putin's going to blame him, then you know where does that go? Um, and so at some point, you know, is there honor among thieves? I don't know. Um, I think right now they're all plenty afraid of him. Um, but you know, this is weird. I mean, if you're working in the Kremlin, the, the boss has gone nuts. I mean, I really think he's unhinged. He's yeah. down in the anti COVID bunker. He's 30 feet away from anybody who has to talk to him. <laughs> and, and, and what really strikes me is that they show that on Russian television. Right. Yeah. Right. Speaking of, by the way, Russian. Speaking of Russian television, um, and the bye propaganda bye. war. Yes, uh, bye looks bye. Like RT is folding. Yeah. Um, but right before we came on, there were reports that people are getting, TIF. yeah, people are getting fired, and we know that a lot of cable providers in the U.S. don't carry it anymore. Europe is basically telling them to go fuck off. So but I don't know if you saw this, but but Rumble, owned by Danny Danny Bingbong and uh, Bongino. And Bongino and uh, Rebecca Mercer and Peter Thiel and some others, they've said they're going to keep carrying RT. Well, of, of course. But because of course they are. Because um, of course they are. Right. Exactly. And you, you, know, you also have, but here's the other thing that, well, over there in Russian state TV, and we had Julia Davis on recently, she monitors all that stuff. I know you watch some of it too, um, Tom, but she was saying how they're using 
the ilk that's coming out of Fox News and some of these pro-Russian people like this retired Colonel McGregor guy who's been a pro-Russian stooge for years, they're taking stuff from American television, the right, and using it over there to support their propaganda crap. I want to show you something T that- Tucker Carlson, they love yeah, Tucker. Yeah, Tucker, mostly Tucker's Tucker. show. Yeah, they, he's like all basically on the payroll there. Um, Lincoln Project did this ad that kind of speaks to what's going on over there <laughs> called Mother Russia. I want to get your reaction. At long last, the glorious invasion of Ukraine begins. Soon, the motherland will take the wayward province into her firm embrace again. Field Marshal Putin offers cheers and many celebrations for American comrades who showed loyalty to Mother Russia. We have much gratitude and thanks for Fox News, most especially Comrade Tucker Carlson. For his loyalty, we'll receive highest Russian honor, the Order of Lenin. We thank Steve Bannon, admirer and student of Comrade Lenin, who led the Republicans to support of Comrade Putin's plans for Greater Russia. We thank GOP Comrade Senator Joshua Howley, who blocked enemies of Russia that the warmonger Biden wished to appoint to his regime. Russia waits 40 years for American Republicans to throw away disgrace of Ronald Reagan. Republicans say they stand for America. Comrade Putin knows better. Wow. <laughs> well, you had to break my heart with that, you know, that one image of Reagan where I just went, ah. Oh. I know, right? You know, I mean, the man is spinning in his grave. I say it all the time, On every the time we talk about this. I, you know, I, I don't, I hate, I mean, listen, all this, you know, you Republicans and Reagan start, you know, I'm sorry. I still, I lived through the eighties, especially when it came to foreign policy. Right. Um, you know, and especially with Soviet policy, it, it is just heartbreaking to think of what the Republican party became. And anybody who thinks that this is the natural outcome of Reagan's uh, of the Reagan revolution is just right. totally it, it, wrong. It, it is, it is wrong. Yeah. Just totally <laughs> off the mark. It's like, it's like you can't, you can draw through lines occasionally on, on, on things that happen in parties. That's just a misreading of history and a misreading of, of a the Wilson ground truth of, mm -hmm. of what happened with Reagan with a, and Thatcher and the Pope with a vision to liberate hundreds of millions of people from Soviet communism. You know, it's consistent with them trying to whitewash history in a lot of ways to fit the narrative today. And it's, well, I, there I are lots like, of people like you guys and others that are out here calling BS on it all the time because it's it's clear what they're saying other, is off the mark. One other thing that, that struck me about that ad, and it's been striking me about pretty much for five years about all the things that you know we've all talked about with the with Trump and now with the Russians is how many of the prominent Americans who have become these kind of fellow travelers are just such small and mediocre people. And God. that kind of explains it in and of itself. I mean, so much. only in this world could Tucker Carlson become what he's become. <laughs> right. You know, like only in this, only in this part of history, could anybody not laugh Josh Hawley off right. the, the, the stage, you know, Mike only in Flynn. this world could Steve Bannon. Right. I mean, I don't even know how to finish that sentence. Um, but it, and I think you know this is kind of the revenge of the of the third string that has decided that if they have to get into bed with the Russians to punish America for undervaluing their obvious talents, right? That you know that they all that they think were, are somehow not being appreciated by uh, you know a foolish country, then that's what they're going to do. But what? But to think that we've reached this terrible point in history because of such a bunch of small and insignificant people is really heartbreaking. I mean, there is no, you at least want your villains to have some greatness in them. And right. instead, this is just <laughs> but a, it's a, Instead, like, it, there's a lot of like, as my grandmother would call them, no count peckerwoods. I mean, mm -hmm. they're just not, they're not sending their best. No. We don't use that one in New England. But yeah. <laughs> Tom, um, you've been really generous with your time, and, and I um, I can't not let you leave without um, two two last things. One, 
how does this end? We see a Russian convoy sitting there. People want to say, they're saying, well, why don't we just blow it to hell? Why is it sitting there? What do we, what should we expect? How does this, what do, what do we expect in the near term? And how does this end in your opinion? I don't, I don't know how it ends. And anybody who confidently sits here and tells you they know is making shit up. Um, yeah. I think it's going to end with a lot of dead people, a lot of destroyed cities. I and mean, Putin is not going to let this go. The no. phone call today with Macron you know, I mean, God, God bless him. The French president literally told Putin today, you are lying to yourself about what's happening. Mm -hmm. right. And Putin basically said, I'm not bombing Kiev. Yeah. You know, too bad Except for all um, the bombs. And you know. yeah, I mean, he just doesn't, he doesn't care. Um, and he's going to kill a lot of people before this is over. I think I'm, I don't want this to end in an East-West confrontation bigger than the one we're already in. I'm worried about an attempted provocation. I think the best outcome is that they become so bogged down that there are people who come to, to Putin and say, boss, you got most of what you wanted. You've taught these neo-Nazis a lesson. Um, you know, we're going to just stay where we are. We're going to turn the whole, all of Ukraine into a frozen conflict for the time being. Uh, and get some kind of a ceasefire. If that happens, um, great. But you know, people in the West need to need to slow their roll. You are not going to get your maximalist demands here, where Putin says, "Okay, I fucked up." You know, I'm uh, everybody going to reverse, and we're sorry, and we're going to put everything back. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Blinken and and Rick, I agree with you. I think the Biden administration has been handling this really well. I you know, I know we all hope for the best for Joe, but I don't think any of us here would be hesitant to criticize him no, at this he, moment. He was messing oh, this up. He's this up. He's um, messing it up. I'd but, be right so, out front and center. Yep. yep. Um, when Blinken came out and said, listen, if they step back, we will immediately step back. And I think what he means is we'll start unwinding these sanctions. We can, the minute you do something positive, you're going to get a positive sure. step in return, but you're going to have to do something positive. Um, yeah. This ceasefire, Tara, that you opened with, yeah, I, or you know, uh, not ceasefire, but this what, negotiation about nego state right. border. I, I mean, it seems perilous to me, but I'm just saying I had to, you know, report it since it was. It I've, I've seen the Russians do that in Chechnya, right? And well, then that's not attack. A good and basically, the safe quarter ended up being an ambush. I don't think they're going to do that this time because they are already the, you know, the, remember the, the world, world had no love for the Chechens. Right. No. Right. You ambush a bunch of Ukrainian, um, you know, a peace delegation and whack them all, you know, in broad daylight that, that, that I think even the Russians are saying, let's consolidate what we've got and, and, you know, try to keep moving. But, but Rick, your point is really well taken about this. They may want to talk a bit because they're, you got a 40 mile convoy. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. Well, and, and there are reports out today, uh, Reuters and others that the, that the Ukrainians have now reached the convoy and they're starting to pick at it. Yeah. And, I saw that they've been, and, they've been know, hitting, really hitting quick, along there. Tom, do you have theories as to why the convoy is stalled? I've been reading all kinds they're of, out of reasons. Is it, they're, is out it well. they're out of gas or is it, is there a strategic play? Is it because they didn't, they thought that Kiev would fall sooner and now they're like, they're out of gas. It? I think they're out of gas. They're out of food. They are the defense department um, publicly confirmed that there are literally guys punching holes in their own gas tanks right. so that they run out of fuel. So they don't have to go do this, That's which is really going to piss off some of their officers. There's going to be some bad stuff happening within the Russian military, but also I suspect when their original plan, uh, you know, went to hell, now they're they're saying, all right, send this giant convoy. But probably back in Moscow, there's a bunch of guys at the general staff working day and night saying, and when they get there, um, yeah, now we'll what? You know. We're working right. on the plan right now. Right. I mean, right. they are they spent months drawing these plans, and now they're having to remake all of their plans on the fly. Even we're pretty good at planning in the United <laughs> States. We, you know, we have our own strategic problems when it comes to big operations but we're we're um uh, you know hip deep in planners the russians oh, yeah. not good not at this. so much not so much well you know what we have to end on a positive note because um this is a heavy conversation and what's happening in ukraine is awful but is everyone who follows us knows that we're all cat parents and Rick has been eager to talk about the Ukrainian cats. And of course, anyone who knows Tom Nichols knows yeah. that he loves his cat, Carla. Well, there is a whole, and Tiki's around here somewhere, there is a whole thing going on 
these are cats in the Ukrainian army. They are putting out these pictures all over Twitter, speaking of the propaganda information war. But we say we stand not only with the people of Ukraine, but with the kitties. This is awesome. I, I favor I favor the liberation and freedom of the Ukrainian cat population. <laughs> when we were off camera, I was just tr just then I was trying to. I'm, I'm trying to lure. Sure. I'm trying to Me lure too. Nameless. Nameless I know. Is over I'm trying, there, to, I'm trying to get Charlie like, to come in come here. And, uh, she... <laughs> I know I Tiki's over here. Somewhere. He's staring at me. He's laying on the couch, staring at me over here because you know. Well, cats see, but do okay, what they this, want. This, this shows that we're all cat parents, right? If these were dogs, we'd go. And That's the dogs right. Right, the dog right there. Go, you know, the cats are like, yeah, whatever. I'm not. You know. That's, that's right, because they know, do what they want where they want. But we, we give a shout but out I do, to I the I do Ukrainian think the cat. information warfare aspect of it is they get the internet better than the Russians get the yes. internet, and it humanizes them. Yes. I don't I mean, remember yeah. the Nazis running around with, you know, uh, you know, doing TikTok dances. You know what I mean? Like they're supposed to be denazification. Get the hell out of here with that. It's asinine. <laughs> and the cat memes, I think, speak to how humanized the Ukrainians actually are. I think if we if we can get a Zelensky meme and a Zelensky cat meme together, we have the super <laughs> weapon that will win this war. Absolutely. And and the you know, and the but... clips of him dancing with the stars, the Ukrainian version. He's got some moves, that Zelensky. Well, God, God willing that, you know, he lives long enough yeah, no for kidding. that for us to, you know, enjoy handing him a cat and. Right. Yes. Know, no, it is. Uh, it is. I mean, the, that that this is the most significant conflict, uh, full on military conflict, you know, in our in, in the modern era in, in many ways. You know, let's be very honest about both Iraq and Afghanistan the front end operations were pretty much tickety talk. The back end operations, not so much. Sure. Well, the this nation one building part. is this one starting badly for Russia. Um, and I think while he can cost Ukraine millions of lives, even it, there's just not a great end state for him because that old Soviet model in the old days, you roll into Hungary or wherever. There were no, there were no, you know, not everybody had a camera in their hand. The world no. wasn't watching at that degree. Once the BBC or the or, or, or the American media were thrown out, that was that. You don't get that anymore. It's a it's a new world. This is the largest. This is a major European war in the middle of the continent. This is everything we have spent seventy five years yeah. trying to prevent and dreading and dreading yeah. every day. And I am again, I am angry. I feel like I lived through the Cold War because the cold war was at least a contest of ideas and mm -hmm. whose socioeconomic system was going right. to rule who you mm -hmm. won't you know, paint of millions of people this is the vanity and, of an old man th right this is a this is the, the millions of people hundreds of thousands of people are going to die millions have been displaced millions more could die because because this guy spent too long in covid isolation because the because the russians who surround him in the kremlin right. are too scared to tell him that he's become a, a delusional old lunatic i mean for this that's we have to yeah. risk the future of humanity it almost right. makes me nostalgic for understanding that if we were going to fight in europe 40 years ago it was going to be for something yeah. That that mattered beyond the immediate lives. I mean, now what matters is the lives of millions of Ukrainians. That's but right. If this thing gets out of control, for what? For what? For because for one old stupid old man, yep. this is insane. A bitter, a bitter guy who was pissed off he had to drive a cab after after the Soviet Union collapsed. And clearly had has been, yeah. I, well, I mean, I, I think that's right. I think and, and for a lot of people around him, just saying for 30 years. Instead of saying, and I remember having this discussion. I'm, I know we're running out of time. I'll just say, I remember right. this discussion with former Soviets in the in the 90s, where they said we're humiliated and these countries look down on us. And they and I said, maybe you shouldn't have been an oppressive, brutal, occupying empire for 70 years, right. and you wouldn't be in this situation. So maybe the new chance now is to become a different kind of country that lives in peace with your neighbors and becomes part of the international community. And I think. I think 90% of Russians said that's where we have to go, especially the younger Russians. But there's, sure. but there were still enough old men who said, I want to do over. I want to, I want one more shot at, you know, the old time religion. I want to try it one more time. And it's going to, it's going to end badly no matter how it ends. No question. Well, we are, um, you know, we're in for the long haul and we stand with the, with the people of Ukraine. 
So on that note, Tom Nichols. Thank you, sir. It is always a pleasure, my friend. Appreciate you coming on. Check nice out his, right. make sure you check out his book, Our Own Worst Enemy, and check out his awesome newsletter over at the Atlantic called Peace the Peace Field. I read it every day whenever he posts. It's phenomenal. And follow him on Twitter. All right, man, All right. we could have we talked about that for another hour and a half. Absolutely. I mean, this, this is one of those shows, but there's just so much to talk about because it is so significant what's going on. And, and you know, some people might think like, why are we talking about this constantly? We've never seen anything like this since the world, since World War II. And folks, is, if it escalates, serious. if it escalates, no one is alive today who remembers the escalation of World War I. Right. Very few people are alive today who remember how quickly World War II escalated. Um, but those lessons should echo for us and we should do everything we can because liberal democracies do not tend to invade their neighbors. Correct. Do not tend to destabilize the world. That's right. So it's, That's, you it know, matters. It, it, this all it matters. matters. It really does. It matters here as well because there are destabilizing forces within our country that uh, are gleefully watching what happens. And we have a former president who currently has an opportunity to get reelected again if he decides to run, that thinks that what Vladimir Putin do is doing is savvy and genius. That should be a warning to every American that sits here and makes excuses for what Donald Trump has said, what he's doing, and what he plans to do, and the Republican Party that supports it. Yep. Wake up. Wake up. All right. On that note, that's the end of Thanks, the everybody. breakdown for this week. Um, tune in tomorrow for Lunch with Lincoln at noon. I think you've got Reed and Stu on tomorrow. Who else is on tomorrow? Oh, and, and Trigvi. They're going nice. to be having a, they're gonna have a, a little chat about what's going on, too. And um, always send us your, your comments, your questions to hashtag Ask the Breakdown. And we continue to pray for the folks in Ukraine. And we will see you guys on Tuesday. Thanks, everybody.